Hi, I'm Judson Cowan, the creator of Hideous Abomination. But you might remember me from such Dark Souls fan art as Laudate Solis, or such soundtracks as Rogue Legacy. It's the middle of lockdown, I desperately need a haircut, but I'm just kind of going with it. And the weather outside in Edinburgh is what the Scots would describe as roasting. So what better time to stay indoors and learn to play Hideous Abomination? As of the recording of this video, the game is still very much in prototype phase, so if you're watching this in the future, you might notice differences in the artwork to the version that you're using. However, if there are significant changes to the rule set, I'll post a link to a new video here, or you can check the description beneath this video to see if a new link's available. With that out of the way, let's learn to play. Hideous Abomination is a tile-laying game for two to five players. You'll be competing against the other players to build and complete an abomination that matches certain criteria. In order to do this, you'll need to play tiles not only on your own abomination, but on other players as well. Play revolves clockwise, with players first rolling and resolving the die, and then playing a tile from their hand onto any abomination. Once an abomination is completed, the game ends immediately and scores are then tallied up. To set up the game, first find these four unique grand prize cards with the gold back that looks like this. Place these face up at the edge of the table out of the way, but where all players can easily see them. Next, find this deck of 10 awards cards with the silver back that looks like this. Shuffle these and deal four face up next to the grand prizes. Keep in mind that these are randomized, so study what's on offer to inform your strategy. Return the rest of the box as you won't need them for the rest of the game. Next, find this deck of 100 body part tiles with a purple back that looks like this. Shuffle them and deal three face up in the center of the table to form what's known as the spare parts buffet. Set the remaining deck next to the tiles with space for a discard pile. Next, find these bolt tokens and place them in piles around the table where all players can easily reach them. Place the die in the middle of the table as you won't need it until all players have completed their first turn. There are two reference cards that can be placed on opposing sides of the table to help players in remembering the turn order or to help in deciphering the icons that appear on the tiles. There's also some two-sided point tokens. These are helpful in scoring, but they can be placed aside as they won't be needed until the end of the game. The general board setup is now complete. Let's now deal out everything the players need to begin play. Find and shuffle the deck of nine torso tiles with the red back that looks like this. Deal one of these face up to each player to form their starting abomination. You can return the rest of this stack to the box as you won't need it for the rest of the game. Next, find this deck of 12 secret objective tiles with the dark blue back that looks like this. Deal one of these face down to each player and then return the rest of the box. Players can always look at their own secret objective card, but they should be kept hidden from the other players at all times. Finally, deal each player three tiles from the top of the body part deck face down to form their opening hand. Players may always look at their own hand, but they should be kept secret from the other players. And with that, we're all set up and we're ready to begin the game. To determine who goes first, players look at the top left corner of their torso tile. The player with the highest number printed here is the first player. On their turn, each player simply rolls and resolves the die, and then plays a tile from their hand onto any abomination. Note that on the first turn of the game, players simply draw instead of rolling, and then play a tile as normal. Now that we know the turn order, let's look at all the possibilities on the die. First up is this eye icon, which matches the eyes on the back of the deck. This is the draw icon. If a player rolls this, they should simply draw one of the three tiles from the spare parts buffet or take a random one from the top of the deck. If they draw from the spare parts buffet, they should immediately replace this with a new tile from the top of the deck, like so. Note that in the unlikely event that there are no tiles available either in the spare parts buffet or in the deck, the game ends immediately and scores are tallied up. Next up is this recycle symbol. This is the refresh icon. If a player rolls this, they should take all three tiles from the spare parts buffet and place them into the discard pile. They then replace them by dealing three new tiles from the top of the body part deck. They then proceed to draw as normal, taking either one of the three new tiles on offer or by taking a random one from the top of the deck and placing it into their hand. Next is this red bolt icon. If a player rolls bolt, they should take one of the bolt tokens from the piles around the table and place it between two tiles in their abomination like this. The bolt must be placed where the artwork meets between two tiles. 
I wouldn't be able to play a bolt here, for example, because the artwork doesn't meet. I also couldn't play a bolt here because there is no adjoining tile. This bolt will stop both of these tiles from being stolen, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Once the bolt has been placed, the player should then immediately roll the die again and resolve the new effect. In this way, it's possible to bolt multiple times in the same turn. If a player is already fully bolted down, they simply roll again until they get a result other than bolt. The final symbol on the die is this black claw. This is the steel icon. If a player rolls steel, they take a tile from any other player's abomination and put it into their hand. Note that both torso and bolted tiles are unable to be stolen. Here, I would be able to take any of these three tiles except for the torso, whereas here, both the torso and these two bolted tiles are unavailable to me. In the unlikely event there are no tiles available to steal, the player simply rolls again until they get a result other than steal. Now that we understand how bolting protects from stealing, it's worth noting that you'll probably get better value for your bolts if you can place it across two tiles that are not your torso, since your torso can't be stolen anyway. Note that you can't steal tiles from yourself. You can, however, steal valid tiles from players that leave awkward gaps, like this. In these cases, the grid remains exactly as it is, and it's up to the player to work with their new reality. This may mean at the end of the game, some tiles remain disconnected from their starting torso, but this doesn't matter for scoring. And that's all the sides of the die. Once the player has rolled and resolved the action on the die, they then choose any tile from their hand to play on any abomination on the board. And the play proceeds to the next player clockwise. It continues like this clockwise until someone successfully completes an abomination by closing off all of its loose ends. A loose end is an area where the artwork meets the edge of the tile. For example, this tile has one loose end, while this one has four. When placing tiles, all loose ends must be matched up, so this would be a valid placement because loose ends have been matched to loose ends. However, I would not be able to play this tile here because this loose end meets a blank edge. Don't forget that tiles can be played on other players as well. These nexus and crotch tiles can give players a lot more work to do before they can complete their abomination and end the game. On the other hand, I might want to play this hand here and end this player's abomination for them, because ending the game sooner may be beneficial to my strategy. Now that we understand the basic gameplay, let's take a closer look at the body part tiles. Each tile has a type, which is indicated by the icon in the circle in the upper right hand corner of the tile. This tile, for example, is a head. This one's a foot, and this one has two types, both nexus and wing. In total, there are 10 tile types, head, foot, hand, wing, tail, torso, nexus, straight, bend, and crutch. Tiles also have attributes, as indicated by the icons and numbers along the bottom of the card. This tile, for example, has four ears, three horns, two noses, and one eye. This tile only has seven digits, and this tile has no attributes at all. In total, there are six different attribute types, tooth, eye, horn, digit, nose, and ear. Tiles also have a color. The color is indicated both by the artwork and by the color of the icons in the tiles. There are nine colors in total, gray, pink, red, orange, yellow, green, teal, blue, purple, and this icon indicates this is a wild tile. A wild tile can count as any of the other colors for the purposes of scoring. The last thing to learn is how the game is scored. This will help inform the strategy you take when selecting, playing, and stealing tiles. When the game is over, either by a player completing their abomination, or when the deck and the spare parts buffet all run out of cards, it's time to figure out who did the best. Now, scores are comprised of three elements. The first is consistency, which has to do with the color of your abomination. The second is the grand prizes and awards that we dealt out at the start. And last is the secret objectives, which were given to us at the beginning of the game. When calculating the totals for each of these, remember to take every tile in your abomination into consideration, including the starting torso tile and any tiles that may have been disconnected from it due to thievery. Let's now take a look at each of these scoring mechanisms individually. To determine your consistency score, first look at your entire abomination, including your torso, and determine your dominant color, or the color of which you have the most tiles. In this example, we have one, two, three blue tiles, one, two gray tiles, one purple tile, and one wild tile. So blue is the dominant color with three. 
In this example, we have one red, two green, two pink, and one yellow. With green and pink tied for two, you can choose either as the dominant color. It makes no difference for scoring. Once you've determined your dominant color, count up all the tiles in that color, add any wild tiles, and the grand total is your consistency score. So if we look at these two examples again, this one has one, two, three blue plus one wild for a grand total of four as its consistency score. This one has either two green or two pink and no wild tiles for a grand total of two as its consistency score. Next, let's look at the grand prizes and awards. The four grand prizes are worth three points each and are consistent from game to game. These four are always up for grabs. The four awards are only worth two points apiece, and these are randomized per game, so make sure you study what's on offer at the start of the game and adjust your strategy accordingly. In this game, we had the objective to complete our abomination, to have the most digits, the most colors, to have the smallest abomination, or the abomination with the fewest tiles, to have the most teeth, the most horns, the most eyes, and the most wings. Now let's talk about how these points get divvied up. First, we would give this done grand prize to the player whose abomination was successfully completed. If no players completed their abomination because the deck and the spare parts buffet ran out, we could simply set this aside and no one would get the points. Then we would look at each of the other cards in turn, determining which abomination meets the criteria. In some cases, this might actually be more than one abomination. If two players are tied for an award, they both get all of the points. You can use these two-sided point tokens to help keep track of score. For example, if two players were tied for showy, I could give one of them the showy grand prize tile and hand the other one this placeholdy point token. This fiddly grand prize looks for the most digits. This abomination only has one measly digit, but it's better than this one which has none. And this one has nine, winning at the fiddly grand prize. Showy looks for the most colors. So players would count up the total number of colors in their abomination, with each wild tile counting as one unique color. This abomination has blue, purple, gray, and one wild tile for a total of four colors. This one has one, two, three, four colors, and this one has an impressive four wild tiles plus three colors for a total of seven, winning it the showy grand prize. These two players are tied for the teensy grand prize, because they each have four tiles in their abomination. So I would give this teensy card to one of them and use this placeholdy point token to give to the other. We would then do the same for each of the awards. If any criteria is unmet by all players, we would simply set that card aside and no one would get the points. Finally, each player reveals their secret objective card. If their abomination meets the criteria on the card, they get two points. If they fail to meet the criteria, they instead lose two points. Keep in mind that the objective still needs to be met at the end of the game, so if they had previously met the criteria and then lost tiles due to thievery, they'd still lose two points. But this player has successfully created an abomination five tiles wide, getting them two points for this bulbous objective. This player successfully created an uninterrupted circle of parts, getting them two points for their Ouroboros secret objective. Once each player has determined their consistency score, passed on all of the grand prizes and awards, and revealed their secret objectives, each player totals all of their points up, and the player with the most points is the winner. This player got four points for consistency, and they completed their abomination, winning the Dunn Grand Prize for another three points. But they failed to meet their secret objectives, so they lose two points, bringing their grand total to five. This player got two from consistency. They won the Fiddly and the Teensy Grand Prizes, and they tied for the Flappy Award. This is a total of 10 points. Unfortunately, they failed to meet their secret objective, losing them two and bringing their total score down to eight. This player got six points for consistency. They won the Showy Grand Prize, as well as the Chompy Award, the Squinty Award, the Pointy Award, and Tied for the Flappy Award. They also hit their secret objective for a grand total of 19 points, making them the winner of this game. And that is all there is to it. There are simplified instructions in the rulebook for younger players that mostly focus on ignoring points and building fun abominations. The rules are also designed to be as flexible as you like, so you can do cool things like make your secret objectives public, you could use all 10 of the awards for a game and see how it goes, you could have two abominations that you work on per player, or you could all work collectively on one big crazy abomination. It's up to you. Thank you for watching. I'm Judson Cowan, and I really hope you enjoy. Yeah, it's a family